Hi, everybody. Um, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule today to join us for what is a pretty darn important topic when we're um, helping people with disabilities get their independence through employment. So today we're going to look at the issue of disclosure and discussion of disability. They each have a little bit of a different spin, and so we're going to give you an opportunity to hear uh, what those different spins are. Uh, we have a primary goal of helping you make decisions and take some actions on those decisions with the consumers that you represent when you visit with business and industry on behalf of them seeking employment. Um, there are going to be six things that we want to take a look at today. And we're going to start by looking at our topic, which is disclosure and discussion of disability, with a subheading um, that is twofold. The first is a legally appropriate way to address disability and uh, employment. And the second is an effective way to disclose disability in job seeking activities. A um, little bit of a different spin on each. The six things that we want to focus on as we go through this presentation would be first to help you make the decision about whether or not you should disclose or advise your consumer to disclose. The second is to um, decide if there are needs that need to be disclosed, how would you go about doing that, particularly what would be some techniques for that dialogue and what would be some issues related to language and labels. So we'll take a look at that. Um, the third area is folding the issue of disclosure related to accommodations into your dialogue when accommodations might be necessary. The fourth will be to look at what to do after there is some disclosure. The fifth will focus on preparing consumers for disclosure if they will be handling that themselves. And finally, we're going to give you some suggestions about how to apply what you've learned as a result of this broadcast. So with that said, let's take a look at our slides and see what we have to offer today. Uh, we're first taking a look at disclosure of disability and consideration of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the reason we're doing that is, as you know, many businesses have constraints now uh, as to what they can ask uh, when it relates to recruiting, hiring, retaining, and promoting people with disabilities. And so in light of those mandates for business, that will flavor what you can and cannot disclose to them or what your consumers can discuss. Um, first and foremost is the issue of consumer confidentiality. And so seeking permission from the candidate to um, disclose if you are representing them to a business is of utmost importance. Um, on the issue of, of getting permission, I recommend that you certainly get it in writing because sometimes people forget what they uh, share with you. And second, it requires a little bit of advanced preparation on your part because um, what you disclose will depend on the different work settings and the different scenarios and abilities of your consumers. Um, it's important to remember to only disclose what is needed that will reflect um, the three bullets on the slide here. Whether or not your candidate for employment is qualified or able to perform the essential functions of the job according to the standards, um, also, whether or not they would need accommodations and what the justification for those needs might be. And the third is safety in the workplace, particularly as it spins off of um, needs for disability. And I would also add to this um, the ability to comply with policies, because sometimes accommodations are needed there. Remember on this what to disclose that you don't need to tell everything about your consumer or you need to advise your consumers they don't need to tell everything. Um, you must know the KSAs, the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the job or the essential functions before you begin making decisions about disclosure. You must also know a little bit more about the job setting to take a look at the work environment, the entrance to and from the job, and so forth, because again, you'll be selecting pieces of information to share based on that. You should also know company policies that would be expected to be followed by your job candidate if they were hired in case accommodations are needed for those company policies. And here's an interesting thing. What you disclose may vary from job to job. If you think about why, it's because the tasks, the settings, or the policies will also vary. Also in consideration of disclosure of disability under the ADA, we'd like to remind you that the employer must keep disability information that you share 
or that your job candidate shares, they must keep it confidential. And they can only disclose to those members of the workforce who need to know. They must also keep any paperwork related to disclosure filed separately. So we're going to look at two things in relation to that today. And the first is we're going to give you suggestions on deciding whether or not to disclose disability-specific information. And then second, we're going to be looking at effective techniques in disclosure for you as rehab professionals to consider when you represent these candidates with disabilities to potential employers. It's kind of a recap of our opening. With that said, um, let's take a look now at um, when or when it might be appropriate to disclose or discuss disability. And I don't mean timing as to when, I mean what situations would it be necessary. And we really have three um, common driving factors that relate to when to disclose. The most obvious one is if the disability is visible or perceived by the employer. If they can see that disability, it's a good idea to have a little bit of discussion on it, even if there are no barriers that are perceived to employment. Because it's kind of like the elephant sitting in the middle of the living room. Um, if, if we're both sitting in a living room and there's an elephant in between us, but we never talk about it, it's a little bit awkward. And this, number one, if we bring it up and, and discuss a little bit, takes away some of that awkwardness. Number two, um, you might consider disclosing disability if that disability limits the individual in the performance of the job tasks or essential functions, actually, or if it uh, impairs their ability to comply with uh, policies that the company has. And then the third reason is if the disability appears to limit the individual in the performance of those tasks or in compliance with employer policies. Because remember this. Um, Perception is reality to that employer. And even though the um, job candidate may have a disability that may not need to be brought up because of accommodations, it would be nice to bring it up because of employer perceptions or even misperceptions. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. A reminder to you, um, be sure to have permission when you're deciding to disclose on these three factors. And also be sure in advance when you get this permission from your consumer to share with them prior to disclosure what you're going to be sharing with that employer so that that candidate knows uh, when you'll be sharing it, what kind of setting you'll be in, and why. This is a big one. Why you'll be sharing that information. Uh, what this does is really to um, enhance the opportunity for informed choice for the individuals with disabilities that we work with. Okay, let's flip that coin over and look at when it might not be necessary to disclose disability. And there are really four reasons. Um, the first is, is the opposite of what we just looked at. If the disability is not visible, it may not be necessary to disclose. And if the disability does not limit the individual in the performance of the essential tasks that they have to do or in compliance with company policies, um, that's a good combo. They probably, you probably would not have to disclose. The third reason, um, if accommodations are not necessary for the performance of these essential job tasks or for meeting job standards or for having access to company benefits. And then the fourth reason is if there are no safety risks that are related to the disability. So if, if the employer can't see the disability, um, if there is no special need for accommodations, if that person can do the job tasks according to standards and comply with policies, and there are not any safety factors, it's probably not necessary for you to have to disclose. Let me encourage you to be painstakingly thorough as you review these in making the decision about disclosure because you'll need to know as much as you can about them before you advise your consumer and before you talk with the employer about uh, disclosure of disability. And keep in mind one important thing. Oftentimes, when you are representing uh, a person with a disability to a business, the employer is going to be wondering what's wrong with that candidate, that they are not either here themselves representing themselves or if they know the name of your organization and it indicates something about the, the, the disability, they're going to be thinking, what's wrong with that person? Many of them will know that's an illegal question, 
but if the question is in their mind, disclosure and discussion become paramount to you being successful in referring that candidate. So, if you decide that disclosure is appropriate either by you or the job candidate, we now want to look at um, how to go about doing the disclosure. And um, there are a number of steps that we can recommend that you follow. Let me go through them quickly, and then we'll come back and recap um, all six of these. First and foremost, it's important to remember to discuss the disability or the, the impairments or the factors that require accommodations without labels. And if you're like me, a lot of us in rehabilitation use a lot of labels, and our brain doesn't even know that we're doing it half the time. So we almost need a censorship between the brain and the mouth before some of those labels or acronyms come out. Second, um, it's important to ask the employer what they know about that particular situation, that particular condition, that particular disability. Third, it's important to clarify any misconceptions or misperceptions or biases that they might have. Fourth, it's important to give some generic facts in a general way about the disability. Fifth, uh, it's then important to give specific facts about your candidate and how that condition is affecting their ability to apply for the job, to do the job, to be accommodated in the job or comply with policies. And then sixth, it's very important to wrap up the um, referencing to disability by closing with some highlights of abilities. Now, let's kind of come back and look at this a little bit more in detail. Uh, and we're going to give you some examples in just a moment, but let's go back through these one, two, one through six items. Discussing it simply um, means that we won't use some of the language that we'll be referencing in just a moment. Using terms like TBI, MR, quad, para are very inappropriate. Uh, and yet you will find that some of those words might pop out of your mouth when you've made the de decision to disclose before you even want them to. And once it's out there, you can't take it back. Once you've shared uh, generically um, the situation that your job candidate has for impairments that are impacting job performance, you then would spend a little bit of time asking the employer specifically, do you know much about that situation? Or maybe something like, um, have you ever employed someone who has had to deal with this kind of a situation. It's a very informative way to open the door to an opportunity to educate that business. Uh, the reason you ask what's known is because you want to be able to answer the misperception, the concern, or even the bias. But you want to do it as an educator, not as somebody in a defensive mode. And that's when you move to number three, which is to clarify misconceptions. Almost always, uh, if you're new to working with a business, they will have misconceptions about certain types of disabilities or conditions. And so number three gives you an opportunity to be an educator. And this is where you would respond very specifically to the misperceptions that you heard or maybe didn't hear but were implied um, when you've asked what they know about that particular condition, impairment, or limitation. Uh, the number four item, which says give brief but general facts first, basically what that means is that we'd like you to um, be generically describing the situation or condition that your person is dealing with um, that will impact job hiring, maybe even job interviewing, certainly job performance and compliance with policies. Um, being generic really eases your way into um, describing what you need to describe. But then you want to move pretty quickly into the specifics of Mary's condition or Tom's situation. Because as we know, but businesses do not, different situations like, for example, um, someone who has cerebral palsy, they might only have mild impairments that spin off of that. Or they might have very significant speech impairment or gait impairment. And so if the employer knows a little bit about the disability, um, but only in one vein, their brain may go right forward into thinking this person's cerebral palsy is going to be severe. And it puts them in a box that is severe when in fact it might not be. So we want to customize the disclosure specific to the job candidate that we are um, referring to that business. And almost always after you've described um, 
the situations that might need some special attention that relate to the disability. It's very important in the same, um, I guess it would be the same dialogue with almost without taking a breath to begin to share what the abilities of that individual are so that you're not ending on what would perce be perceived to be a negative note. Let's take a look at some examples of the labels that might be used. Um, one label that is um, an important one for people who are advocates within this group is the label of seriously mentally ill. Uh, I know one time I spoke with a group of family members who have um, individuals in their family who have um, mental illness. And they wanted me to refer to them when I marketed their family members to business as SMI or seriously mentally ill. Because from their perspective, that was very important. But if you think about how that label might bias an employer just by language alone, um, it's important to, to realize and to help educate family members that um, this is not the best way to go. We, we try to lead on a positive note. Mentally retarded, learning disabled, all those acronyms that we use, TBI, CP, LD, MS, SCI, uh, you might think I would never use those labels when I went out to an employer, but it's amazing how our mouth is sometimes too quickly connected to our brain, as I said earlier. Keep in mind also on these labels that when you go and introduce yourself to a business, either in person or on the phone, or if you even send them literature, there is, in a sense, almost automatic but generic disclosure of disability. If the title of your organization indicates that you have something to do with people with disabilities. So in that sense, there is generic disclosure that is not specific to your job candidate even before you begin to talk about your job candidate. And again, your consumers will need to know that because if you're out there representing them to business, there is automatic disclosure that they have a disabling condition just by the nature of your business. So let's talk a little bit about language with business. We want to remember that there shouldn't be any acronyms, we've mentioned that, but we also want to encourage you to talk their talk. Remember that labels put people in boxes, and the worst thing we can do is to take our job candidate and put them in a box that doesn't need to be there. So let's take a look at a few bad, better, best scenarios that might help you in learning how to move through disability and related issues without the boxes. Uh, on the issue of disability and labels, let's first look at um, MR, LD, MI, TBI. That's the bad scenario because it's acronyms that we use internally. Of course, what would be better is to start with the person first, a person who is mentally retarded, a person who is learning disabled, a person who has traumatic brain injury. But what is really best is um, generically using words that focus on ability and how tasks will be performed, especially if those tasks will be done differently. Let's take an example here. Um, let's pick learning disabled. You could say LD, but we know that that's not the best way to go. If you take learning disability and use the full term, um, that's okay, but you might think about something different that would describe learning disability. Now, some folks have said, well, that's a cognitive impairment. Okay, that's a little bit better, but cognitive impairment is very rehabby. Um, some folks might say something like this, well, my candidate is LD in math, or my candidate is learning disabled in reading comprehension. Well, that's a little better, but it is still not the best way. What you might want to consider doing in this scenario is to say, I have a person who learns things differently. The way they learn is a little bit different from the way that you and I learn. So, um, as an example, and I'm still dialoguing with the employer here for you, you might say, um, this person, if they had to read a training manual, probably would do better instead of reading that manual if we could put that on an audio cassette. And see, what you've done is never focused on learning disability. You've focused on a special need, and you've focused on a solution for that need. That's a really good way to think about it, but it requires practice, and it requires um, a little bit of homework on your part. Let's take a look at um, disclosure when it relates to accommodations. 
and there's a bad, better, best scenario, but there's even better than what you can see on your slides. Some folks in my own agency um, have said, okay, let's talk about compensatory strategies with the employer when we dialogue about disability. Well, you know what? I think compensatory strategies are really confusing to me, and they certainly would be confusing to employers. So it's probably a good idea not to use that language. Sometimes if you simplify a little, you might talk about functional limitations, you might talk about special needs, you might talk about impairments. But even those concepts can be improved upon. Talking about worksite accommodations is a good way to go, but there might even be a better way. And I'm wondering as you're listening to this telecast if you can think of a better way. Um, let's give an example back with learning disability. Um, and the example is repeating the one we gave earlier in a sense. If you have a job candidate who's learning disabled in the area of reading, giving the suggestion that in a, way, a way to accommodate this person in the workplace might be to offer them that manual audibly uh, is really talking about accommodations without using even the language accommodations. Again, depending on the disabilities that you each work with, it's important to pick through them the way we just did with examples for learning disability. Now, let's look at dialogue or disclosure of disability in another way. Some of the disability factors to consider before an interview um, would be the following. Number one, ask how will the disability affect the person's ability to do the job. And remember, you can't do this unless you've looked at the job, looked at the job description, looked at the work environment. Uh, another thing to focus on will be this. Will the individual need any accommodations in the application process or even in the interviewing process? And something I'd like to mention here that's brand new thinking in the last maybe two to three years is even the issue of online applications um, and whether or not the issue of disclosure will come up there. Keep in mind that if employers who are mandated by affirmative action to um, indicate if they are recruiting and hiring people with disabilities at some point in the recruiting process need to inquire or give their candidates an opportunity to disclose whether or not they have a disability. This becomes particularly awkward in online applications, but I'll give you a tip. Uh, don't leave any answers out on online applications and don't lie. And if the questions relate to disability, keep in mind that they might be asking because of affirmative action mandates. Uh, another way to look at this under disability factors is to consider will there be a need to review any job modifications or accommodations in the interviewing and selection process. If the answer is yes to any of those issues, then it will probably be necessary to disclose the disability-related factors the way we've suggested you disclose them. Now, if possible, it would be really nice to have the individual who's applying for the jobs to bring up the disability themselves and then have them help the employer see how the job will be done. But let's remember this. If that consumer cannot acquire the finesse or the skill or have the comfort zone that is positive in disclosure of disability, then somebody else needs to do that. And my guess, it's probably going to be you if you're listening to this telecast. Now, after we've done disclosure, there are some factors that we have to pay attention to. Let's take a look at what happens or what should happen after disclosure. First and fo foremost, there should always be follow-up. Um, with that business and with the job candidate. The first thing we want to find out from the employer if the participant or job candidate went on their own is how did they come across? Uh, real important feedback for all of us since we are trying to help that person get that job. Um, also, particularly if you're involved in the disclosure, find out if the employer has any concerns about the impact of that disability. If the job candidate has gone on their own and disclosed and you're making a phone call to the employer to follow up, this is an important question to ask them because that employer might feel more comfortable disclosing any misperceptions or concerns to you, but not to that candidate who brought up the disability. If you've disclosed and um, you're in with that employer at the point of disclosure, obviously this is something you want to ask about while you're there disclosing. 
And then, of course, it's very, very, very important to deal directly with any misperceptions or concerns that you may find out in this um, follow-up piece, whether it's happening in person or after the um, visit or the job interview. So we're going to give you basically seven steps to follow um, in dealing with misperceptions that come about because of disclosure of disability. And let me read through those seven first, and then we'll come back and talk about each one of them separately. First and foremost, listen fully to the concern that relates to the disability disclosure. Second, qualify that concern. Third, acknowledge that it's a valid concern. Fourth, convert that concern to a question. Fifth, give specific facts about the disability. Sixth, make your point to help with education. And seventh, check to see if the employer understands and agrees. Now, let's backtrack. What does it mean, listen fully to the concern? Well, what's important here is that you allow the employer to finish their thought about the disability. Many of you may be like me. Um, I start to formulate a response as soon as I hear something negative. And in that sense, I stop listening. And so before you start to respond back about um, something unique to that disability that the employer might misunderstand or be afraid of, um, let that employer finish. Because sometimes the real concern may be at the end of what they are saying. Sometimes the real concern may not be voiced, and you may have to ask some other questions to find out what the real concern is. And that moves us to number two, which is qualify the concern. When you think you've heard what misperception or bias the employer has about the disclosure of disability, you want to repeat it back to that employer. And the reason you do that is to see if you heard what they said. If they say to you, nope, that is not really my concern about the disability, then you go back to number one and you say, I'm sorry I missed your point. Please tell me again. Okay, now number three, which says acknowledge the concern, might be really hard for some of you, um, particularly if you're, if you're a powerful advocate or a passionate advocate for people with disabilities. Acknowledging a concern just is basically saying, let the employer know that their misperception uh, is valid. And remember that perceptions are reality, so that's their reality. Let me give you two ways that you might acknowledge a concern. And you can find your own way or use one of these two. One of them would be to say something like this. You know, Mr. Employer, I have heard that issue about this particular disability or this particular uh, impairment so many times from other businesses, and I appreciate you sharing it with me. Now, another way you might do it is to say something like this. And this happened to be true for me many, many years ago, probably 30 years ago, when I was new to the world of disability. Um, Mr. Employer, when I was new to disability, I had that exact same perception or concern. And um, I certainly think it's a valid one, and I'd like to help give you some information about that. And do you see how nicely that segues into number four, which is to convert the concern that the employer has to a question? Why do you do that? Why do you think? Well, basically, you're converting it to a question so that you can answer your own question. That's how we do the education about uh, the disability, so that we can move beyond disclosure as a barrier and turn disclosure into an opportunity for education. Oftentimes you've heard it said that lawyers never ask a question in court that they can't answer. It's the same philosophy here. Now, once you've con converted the concern or misperception to a question, you have the opportunity now to give specific facts about the disability. What we would recommend here to you is that you start by giving some general information about the person's condition that you're representing, and then bring it down to marry the person, never ending on a negative, always talking about what they can do, either with or without accommodations. And that's how you make your point. Um, and then finally, see if the employer understands and agrees with what you've said by saying, does this sound like we can move forward now? If they say no, do you know what you do? You go right back to listening to their concern and you move through this. Let me give you a suggestion on these seven steps. 
You can only move smoothly through them if you practice them. I would recommend that you um, choose someone that's been a part of this webcast and do a little role playing to see if you can move through these smoothly. Okay, the last portion of our overview wants to give you some tips on preparing your consumer for disclosure. So first and foremost, it's going to be important that you evaluate how the individual comes across when discussing disability. So you might want to have them try doing that in the office with you. Just flat out ask them to do it. Then you'll want to determine his or her knowledge about any unique needs related to disability. This is very important. I have found over time that many of our consumers do not know enough about their own disabling situations to be able to disclose them accurately. And then what's worse is that they don't know how to share, how to accommodate those special needs. And this is a great opportunity to do job readiness or employment readiness work with our consumers. In fact, I think all employment readiness activities should include some role playing on discussing disability and also discussing accommodations. Next, you want to find out, and this is extremely important, how that individual treats concerns or beliefs that they hear from someone else about a disability. What's their reaction? Um, throw a few misperceptions at them when you are having them disclose disability and see how they're responding. Watch their body language. Watch the words they use. Watch their attitudes because we might need to help them with um, some changes to that. And if you find that the person takes offense about misperceptions on disability and they can't get over that, then it might be important for you to be the person who does the disclosure. Um, because that, that negative reaction from a person who's disabled, hearing what might be perceived to be something negative from a business can be a real showstopper. Um, and so to make this as um, effective as possible with businesses, you're going to want to be sure that the disclosure piece is properly handled by your consumer or job candidate. And if you know that they cannot do a good job with that, even with practice, then I would recommend that you step in as their advocate and as kind of the uh, schmoozer, the peacemaker. Some other tips on preparing for your consumer for disclosure. Um, there are some very good resources out there that can help you. So use existing resources to help that consumer and to help yourself become more knowledgeable about his or her disability and accommodations that offset any uh, barriers that might come about because of that disability. Some of the best ones uh, or best resources, I should say, that I have used myself and with our staff for our consumers are um, listed on this slide, the Job Accommodation Network, Cornell University, and TTAP websites. They have marvelous information. But I know that from Jan and Cornell, at least, you can get lost in a sea of information. Um, on your um, PowerPoints, you have the addresses for all of these websites. And I want to pause and make some remarks about a couple of them and tell you why I like using them. Um, at the Job Accommodation Network site, you could spend five or six days going through the marvelous materials that they have. But the link that we've given you on the slides takes you directly to um, a drop-down box that will allow you to look at maybe, oh, I would say maybe 35 different types of disabilities. And when you click on and choose the type of disability that you're interested in finding more information about, you get um, a document that might range from three to seven pages long. And it has some incredibly good information that will educate you as a rehab professional about the disability that you're reading about. Um, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it does, uh, and a little bit about the varieties of that disability. And then it starts to give the kinds of questions that might be needing to be asked uh, when you go to a job site to see if your candidate can not just do that job, but it will help you be thinking, do I need to be disclosing? this disability. And then what's even better is that it gives you examples of um, ways to accommodate. So it basically in one package gives you all the information that you need to not just educate your consumer about the words that describe their disability, their impairment, or their condition, but also gives them educational information about how they can be accommodated. It's a good teaching tool. It's a good marketing tool. And by the way, 
businesses love these kind of fact sheets as well. We've used this a lot with employers we work with. The Cornell University uh, website, I've used that as well. That is, is very nice if you go exactly to this very long address that we've shared with you uh, and scroll down about halfway on the page. Uh, you can print off in PDF format a very nice looking two-fold or two-page fact sheet that describes disability, that describes common accommodation, and that lists other resources. So again, a nice information fact sheet for businesses or for your consumers. And um, recently I looked at the TTAP website and saw a very nice how-to guide in um, the kinds of questions you need to be focusing on when you discuss disability. So just wanted to be sure you had those resources so that you didn't have to reinvent the wheel because they've got some pretty darn good wheels. In our wrap-up, um, I want to give you a suggestion. And that suggestion is to make this yours, you need to apply it. And so our last two slides suggest to you that you select a disability for the individuals that you work with routinely. What is a common disability that you know you're going to have to be describing at some point to uh, a business? Uh, find a partner who is aware of the best practices that we've just shared with you. And plan on doing a role play for the disclosure techniques that we've taught. Uh, for your consumers with that particular disability in mind and do them the way we've described. You've got a couple of nice slides that you can come back to and use as part of your role play. I strongly encourage you to do that not too long after this session and the chat room questions that you might be asking. Once you've completed that role play, reverse roles. And it's interesting to watch how your partner, who hopefully has seen this telecast, would also deal with disclosure issues. And then after you've both role played, ask each other for feedback, because the feedback is what helps the most. It gives you the opportunity to um, hear and see what you've said. It also gives you the opportunity to do better. And if you're really brave, um, videotape yourself. There's nothing like seeing the words you choose, the way you disclose and um, how you might improve that. I hope this uh, information will help you in the future. Um, as a member of the Department of Rehabilitation Services in the state of Alabama, I appreciate being invited and thank you so much for joining us today.